there or your name, can you make sure that's um, delete, uh, covered over. Um, but I think that the recording will probably be focused on uh, Graham and Kean. Are we ready to get going, do you think, Mags? Yeah. Are you all right, Kean? So um, we'll have to ask Kean to unmute. Oh, so just, oh, you are. I can actually, yeah. You can. OK, great. So um, please keep your uh, yourselves muted. If you there will be parts of the presentation where um, you'll be asked some questions at the end, there'll be a QA. and a So please just raise if you know how to raise uh, the yellow hand at the bottom of the screen. I think it's if you hover over the bottom bar, there's a reactions button. So uh, raise your hand. Um, Teresa, I'll help you in a minute, OK? Um, and if you will ask you to unmute and then you can ask your question there. So tonight we've got a really exciting presentation. I first met Guy and, and Graham probably a couple of months ago and they shared this with me and I was so impressed with all the hard work that they put into it and the thought. It's so detailed and they thought about all of the elements um, of their land trust. So I think you're going to be really excited and impressed um, and I'm just going to hand over to Kian who's going to start the presentation. Okay. okay, thank you. Thanks, Sammy. Um, yeah, I am going to open with a few. We've got a few slides where I just ask people to raise hands, which obviously when you're in a room together is easy enough. But if I'm, I'm going to give it a go. So yeah, it is. It's, you hover over the bottom and there's a little reactions button and then you can just say raise hand uh, and lower hand. Um, so yeah, uh, I would ask that you keep questions for the end. Um, feel free to put them in the chat if, as you think of them, but I'm, but I'm not going to answer them until the end. Uh, and also we're doing, so this presentation is very much on the common ground model. Um, so if you could keep questions to kind of relating to the model and how it might fit with you and your life, um, because next week we're going to do a much broader meeting about like what we're doing and how people can get involved and, and that's going to be much more aimed at how people can actually help and get involved but for this for this meeting questions more in relation to like the model itself just so we can hopefully get into a really good discussion about that um, and 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 find some clarity for people um, great so let me share my screen It's all good. Okay, are people seeing that? Yeah, brilliant. Okie doke. Minimize that. There. Cool. Okay, let's do this. So, the Common Ground Project: An Introduction. Land trusts for diverse people, food, ecology, and economy. Have I got spacebar? None of that. Click. Brilliant. Okay, before we begin, we have some questions for you. So this is a raise hand function. I am just going to switch. Oh, yeah, actually, for this bit, I am just going to switch out of the, uh, uh, if I can, just go back into gallery view, just so that I can see people actually responding to this. So let's go to gallery. So please raise your hand if you own land. Yeah, okay, quite a few. Uh, raise your hand if you would like to own land. Yeah, <laughs> yeah a, lot, a lot of people. Everybody. A lot of people, everyone pretty much. Well, yeah, it's fascinating doing this presentation to different groups. But uh, anyway, we'll talk a bit more about that later. Um, raise your hand if you're not fussed about owning or producing on land, but you'd like to see the land meeting your needs in an ecologically sound way. Mainly hands. Yeah, nice. Whoa, a lot of yellow hands. Great. Um, and raise your hand if you believe every human should have the right to meet their needs from the land without being forced into the destructive action. Oh, yes, loads of hands. Whoop, whoop, whoop. I love that question. I love being in a room full of people who are like that feeling of like, yes, 
this is what we're going for. This is what we're about. Ah, right, thank you very much. Right, let's go back to, let's go back to screen share. Let's do that. Okay, look. Oh yeah, tell us some of your land-based aspirations. So actually for this, I'm gonna, I forgot about this bit, so I'm just gonna stop share again, just so I can briefly, so for like 30 seconds, as in like a little 30 second slot, is there someone who would like to just very briefly say their name and say what they'd like to do on the land or with the land? People might have to just lower their hand if, if um, from the previous question in case they've still got it raised, just True. to warn you. Yeah. <laughs> We've got two, two hands still up. Um, Hayley, did you want to answer the question? I can, um, oh, Mags can ask, at, uh, unmute you. Sorry, I raised my hand to Graham's initially <laughs> and I didn't realise it didn't go down on its own. So sorry. <laughs> Don't apologise, <laughs> absolutely fine. <laughs> uh, oh, we've got one, Fop, Fop, Fop S. Fopper. My name is Fopper, as the only one with that name in the whole of the United Kingdom. Um, my background, when I was 21, I lived in a kibbutzim in Israel, the most oh. short kibbutzim, Iriat Shmona. Later on, I was involved in setting up eco-villages in some wow. countries. I'm a spatial planning expert on European level. I'm retired. Um, at the moment, I'm working with uh, the development of 200 acres of land that was offered to me as a legacy to the people. Oh. It is one of the five locations that we have. That's it. Thank you. Great. Well, OK. What are you are you lo looking to produce, though, on the land? What's your kind of in a just in a nutshell? What's your kind of dream for your own life on the land? It's not a dream. We have strategy. Oh. Yeah, OK. Um, the glue between all the elements is uh, the spiritual life approach. We uh, designed our own road, our own road map for that. The actions are community farming, um, healing, a healing center, an educational center, a uh, uh, center of excellence as how you can do things in permaculture, and, uh, and everything connected to it. And um, also the connection with care for the vulnerable people. Uh -huh. Wow, amazing. Brilliant. There's amazing. more, but those are cool. now. No, that's great, thank you. That's wicked, thanks for sharing. Um, anyone else, does anyone else wanna have a- You need an entry level. Yeah, we do need an entry level, yeah. Is there anyone here who doesn't currently, who isn't running 200 acres which is one of five sites and you've already got everything kind of mapped out. Is there someone here who's like relatively new to the game who would like to just briefly speak? Jason or Carl, Carl Sorrell? Hi there, I don't mind jumping. Um, to put it simply, me and a group of close friends in, in Birmingham in the Midlands are, are looking to set up an oasis, an accessible oasis outside of the city um accessible to all walks wow. of life and one that produces so much food that it overflows into the city to people that need it um, <laughs> yeah. um, one more let's go for let's go for one more Wait, can i quickly interrupt teresa yeah. sorry teresa uh -huh. do you mind putting your thing on um mute for me please i'm so sorry <laughs> I'm so sorry, I have to, oh, here we go. Am I not on mute? Sorry, on mute. Thank you. Sorry to... No, great, that's all good. Uh, Jason Bamber, would you like to... Hello, it's not Jason, oh. it's Catherine. I figured. Um, I'm Jason's wife, he's here. Hello, um, here. We've got, we've only got 15 acres, um, but we've, we're growing food, um, creating a woodland we've got some uh, ponds in new hedgerows and things like that we're wanting to make it um community based really um and our daughter has special needs and learning difficulties um and her 
and friends and that are in the same sort of boat really struggle after they sort of leave college of where to go and things to do so we'd like to be able to bring them into into the project we're not sure how um we go about it or anything really we only came across you earlier today and we just thought it might be worth coming on and seeing if you can help us with trying to think of that dream we've got some sheep and the plan is so it's all permaculture it's all no dig um all pesticide free so it's all very eco and we're doing everything sort of the permaculture way just planted six thousand trees great wow that's a lot of trees yeah awesome oh cool um yeah well great let's get into it let's see let's see what how we might find find inspiration you've got a sheep in a no dig garden as your example there sheep in a no dig garden a sheep in a no dig market garden yeah there you two yeah nice okay yeah sheep in a no dig market garden let's go for that right <laughs> so here we go back to screen yes so is this thing? You're right. Oh no! Hang on. There we go. Up and down. Okay. Us. Yes. Hello. Um, Hello. Oh gosh. Hello. A gentle reminder Hello. for everyone to please keep yourselves muted um, because it really does mess up the sound uh, for everyone else and it becomes quite difficult to listen. Um, so please do mute yourselves uh, until the end when we will be having a Q and A. <laughs> um, yes. So hi, my name is Kian Dalglish. I am. Uh, a co-founder of the Common Ground Project. I have a master's degree in anthropology, environment and development from University College London. And uh, I spent three years coordinating Stanford Regenerate um, with my wonderful partner, Graham Willett, who may now enter the screen, although I can't, I can't actually see us, so I don't know what we're gonna look like, but anyway. <laughs> um, yeah, Graham Willett, who's also co-founder of the Common Ground Project, um, and he's got 20 years working in food production, farming and market gardening, um, and five years creating and coordinating Stanford Regenerate, which was, or is actually, it's ongoing, a collaboration between Stanford Hall, Leicestershire, Leicestershire County Council, the Soil Association, and other local farms and businesses to use school food procurement to regenerate farmland across Leicestershire. Uh, this was how we met and it's not letting me do that here we go our story yes um so we bought some land we bought uh, 47 acres of the most beautiful land uh, which you can see some of in this picture um down just outside Lyme Regis with the intention of finding out how many of our problems we could solve by freeing up access to land um and we've just we're at the business end of two years uh research asking people one, how would you like to use the land? Two, how would you like to see the land best used for common good? And three, what is stopping you from living the ecological life that you long for? Sorry to interrupt, Ian. Sorry, I think you need to share your screen again. I don't know if anybody else is having troubles, but I can't see the presentation. Oh, really? I yeah. I th I'm gonna see it. Right, let me try oh, can again. Other, can other people see it? Yeah, Maybe it's just me. Yeah, yeah, we can see it. Oh, I'm so sorry. That's my fault Aww. completely. Oh, that's totally fine. No, okay, I can see it. again now. Can you see that now? Saying? Great. What's going on? Yeah, okay, I can see it. Okay. okay. <laughs> We're all right. May I continue? I'm assuming. Great. Okay. Thumbs up. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Um. Yeah, how would you like to use the land? How would you like to see the land best used for common good? What is stopping you from living the ecological life that you long for? Three questions. So question one, how would you like to use the land? So by assessing the wishes of the people that we questioned against a decision-making matrix that drives land use towards regenerative practice, as per Richard Perkins' regenerative agriculture, and common good. Uh, and from that, we found that all but two land usage proposals beat all current broadacre agricultural systems on both ecology and productivity diversification. All but two, one of which I think was an equestrian, there was an equestrian and there was a, uh, an animal sanctuary um, and they did not beat 
uh, current broadacre agricultural systems, but every 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 other one did. Um, and what this showed us more than anything was that the lack of diversity in farming is not coming from a lack of a wish or intention to diversify farming or even the labor force to diversify farming. So why, why then? Second question, how would you like to see the land best used for common good? Um, from this question, we found again, <laughs> all but two uh, proposals met the wider demand for the proposed goods and services provided from the land. That is to say that every other proposal met what people were wanting in terms of like, I just want good organic food for me and my family. I want to see a pumping diverse farm with lots of people doing what they want to do. Uh, I just want a small, affordable, ecologically sound home near my food source. Three, what is stopping you from living the ecological life that you long for? <laughs> Big question. So the main barriers, the main barriers to these ideals and ecological living on the land were First and foremost, policies within planning and other agricultural policy making organizations. Now, I think in this room, that's not so much of a surprise in some rooms that people just don't know that, but that is the number one. And this is coming from, this is not coming from people who don't have experience. This is coming from experienced land workers who are able to professionally work and produce regeneratively. And even they are saying that the number one barrier to living on the land is policies within planning and other agricultural policy making organizations. Um, so the second one was farming economics, um, the price of land weighed against profitability. Uh, and this is just getting worse and worse and worse. Um, and then being stuck in a current rent trap situation. So people working to pay for their accommodation so that they can live and just not having any spare time or resource uh, to move into anything else. Um, and it's just to clarify, most regenerative land workers are not high flying city folk who have a lot of resource available. They tend to be quite humble people um, who just want to get on the land. Um, so policy, key destructive policies, which we found. Firstly, the requirement for a, of a viable agricultural business plan from new entrants as standard. So most economically viable agricultural businesses are environmentally destructive. There is a reason that they're economically vi viable and that's because the extraction is overstepping the inputs and um, making it environmentally destructive. So this policy actively prevents regenerative farming enterprises from establishing like genuinely re regenerative enterprises from establishing. Um, number two, competition for land from the global carbon stock exchange markets is set to further exacerbate the problem of economic viability with little mention of food production in most recent DEFRA policies to support human activity. So this one is massive and this is being rolled out as we speak um, in policy. I mean, the Forest of Dean has already been floated on the International Stock Exchange. Land value now is basically being held in how much carbon can we sequester in this? Um, with no mention of food production, that's the other thing, is it's how much, how much carbon can we sequester without having people on the land? Um, because actually we can talk more about this, but, but human-led human regenerative farming systems are, are yeah better than rewilding, that's for sure. Um, three, lawful occupation of land is strongly inhibited due to lack of access to amenities. Uh, this is used very heavy handedly in areas very close to amenities. Um, and most amenities that service built up areas are environmentally destructive in comparison with off grid solutions. Um, and that's something we're gonna talk a bit more about, but in terms of, yeah, the kind of requirements to be plugged into a grid which is fundamentally destructive and so inefficient, um, but then that's used as a reason to stop people uh, lawfully occupying land. Um, a summary of the current planning system. I'm just gonna minimize that so you can see. So yeah, the national planning framework is basically composed of a list of red tape options that can be used to interact with broader policy. Um, it's a, it's a list of reasons that you could say no to an application. Um, this combination is intended to remove wealth and people from land, replacing them with industrial systems. And this has been the case since Roman occupation. This trend 
<laughs> I know because I've looked, I've traced it. And uh, yeah, so secondly, 20% of the population actively suppress human betterment. Uh, and it is these people that the policy is designed to serve. Planning policy on its, on its own could be considered relatively innocent, but the point is that it can be wielded by people who have negative intentions um, or who just don't want to see anyone else succeed, of, of which, yeah, 20% of the population. Um, so on the local level, this is commonly known as NIMBYism, um, and AONB is a great example of this, and this is something we've been, with our land, coming up against is the classification of AONB being wielded against, I mean, any attempt to diversify or develop in any direction, really. Um, a true planning framework would offer support in planning based upon human need rather than economics and would automatically lead to abundant rural livelihoods. And by using coordinated mobilization via our regenerative rural planning network, um, which we'll talk a bit more about later, we can shorten our food supply chains, coordinate productive endeavors, and influence planning policy, planning policy at a national level. Yes, so we uh, did all this research, asked all these questions, have gone, <laughs> gone really hard into all of this, as you can probably tell. Um, so we decided, one, to give the land away to those who can regenerate. Two, to create a support organization to facilitate the gifting of more land into trust and to support them through planning policy and development. And three, to conduct multiple Q&A sessions to ascertain how multiple enterprises and livelihoods could be integrated and established on the same piece of land. Uh, and through these sessions, we found that we needed, firstly, a whole land usage pattern, as in a land usage pattern which could be applied to any site uh, in principle, uh, a slavery-free economic system, and a solution for low impact living. So, just to take a little moment to zoom out and look at the problems we're kind of collectively facing as we see them, the weight of, the weight of what we're facing. So we've got environmental destruction, the almost blanket removal of all Earth's self-regulating ecosystems, which is creating massive instability worldwide. Um, yeah, we're seeing this more and more. Farmland degradation, soil erosion, desertification and compaction. How many harvests do we have left? Various numbers being thrown around, no one really knows. Economic crisis, cost of living, cost of energy, cost of food, housing, health, education, you name it. We are in the storm and we need better ships. Uh, housing shortage. We've got a lack of access to affordable housing and housing estates that produce accommodation, but not homes. Um, and a lack of access to meaningful livelihood, uninspiring work, debt slavery through rent traps and mortgage, uh, and ever increasing centralization of wealth and resources. So to zoom in just a little bit, the problems within farming as we see them. So we've got extremes in weather, unpredictable conditions, droughts, floods, uh, breakdown of traditional seasonality again, which is just becoming more and more clear. Um, soil health decline. So the lack of diversity in farming, uh, meaning more intensive machine heavy practices, uh, which leave soil heavily depleted. Uh, the breakdown in efficacy of industrial methods. This one is, this one is massive, especially right now. The increased inputs only exacerbating the conditions that create the need for increased inputs. And it's basically a breaking point. The industrial farming system is at breaking point because of this. Um, the sale of farm buildings without agricultural ties, so the reduction in farm housing, um, because it's been sold off separately uh, or turned into Airbnb or whatever, uh, which leads to larger farm sizes, which leads to the necessity for more industrial practices because you're trying to manage so much land. Um, and again, the deterioration in ecology, uh, which comes with that. Uh, and then you've got all of that uh, up against prohibitive planning policies to support ecological living. So the economy of existing large farms is literally impossible, but getting more people onto the land is extremely difficult. Diversifying in farming is extremely difficult because of planning policy. <sighs> so <laughs> the Common Ground Project solutions, what we said, well, yeah, but, what, what we're gonna do about it. So firstly, community land trusts. So we create 
independent but connected community land trusts. Uh, we utilize collective abundance and drive it towards development and land acquisition. Uh, we use, we create, created a new inter-farm economic model. So we're calling it tripartite altruistic economics, and we'll talk about it more later in depth. Uh, but the basic idea is that it gives the producer control over production and pricing. And, and then the model dovetails with the broader economy. We'll talk more about that. Uh, and then food processing and sales cooperatives. So we develop on behalf of the land worker and the community to give accessibility to upvaluing and sales avenues via independent but connected cooperatives. Basically facilitating getting the most out of uh, surplus produce. So more about the community land trusts themselves. So this is a non-ownership model. This is taking land out of private ownership and putting it into trust driven towards common good and regenerative practice. Um, we create cross-generational agrihood. Uh, so we're using fully off-grid mobile tiny houses that meet all of the users' needs within regenerative settlement. And we'll talk more about that later, but it's like uh, allowing for uh, every stage of life to be present um, in the structure. Uh, and then on the ground, farming and food processing cooperatives. So open and accessible cooperative enterprises that use this economic model that serves its members rather than an external profit machine. Housing. Fully off-grid mobile tiny homes. So we are no longer living in the stone age. We have the technology. Uh, with all of the innovation there has been, we can now create fully off-grid mobile tiny homes designed to meet the permanent living and working needs of most people. Um, this is a picture of um, mine and Graham's beloved farm ark, which we actually lost in a fire. We don't have to talk about that. Um, but this uh, was designed with the functionality of a farmhouse. So this is uh, drying down and food storage, uh, propagation space equivalent to a sizable greenhouse. If you can see that huge front window there um, that has all of this racking that you can use for propagation space, uh, solar energy capture, rainwater capture, catering capacity for up to 200 people uh, and can sleep three very comfortably and up to seven. Um, although you wouldn't want to, <laughs> you wouldn't want to be doing the catering uh, while seven people were sleeping in there, that's for sure. Um, and the idea behind this uh, is, is we do have funding to create another one, just to be clear. Um, yeah, as a live work unit, which can be deployed to any piece of land, any piece of land, and immediately create a diverse regenerative farm. And this prevents us from having to choose between farmland and housing, which is, again, from an economic perspective, is just, it just doesn't make any sense. Um, but that's where we are. Uh, so simple units can be built for as little as £10,000, uh, and your imagination really is the limit. Um, and I think maybe at the end I'll, ha I'll ask um, Rachel Trafford, who's heading up our Tiny House Collaboration UK group, uh, to just introduce herself. Oh, oh, that's next week. That's next week. I'm not going to do that. Cancel that, Rachel. You're, you're all good. Um, this house was uh, 65,000, um, but it was a prototype and it has been it was built with an awful lot of uh, functionality in mind. And it was achingly beautiful. And we lived in it for two blissful weeks. Um, anyway, incredibly light environmental footprint, twinned with regenerative living and farming. Uh, a carbon negative lifestyle really is assured. It really is assured. You're capturing your energy from the sun, you're capturing your rainwater, and you're working, you're, you're farming regeneratively, you're storing carbon year on year. It's a no brainer. Um, and there is a network of builders waiting for your order and cooperative groups for those of you who wish to build your own. So that's housing. That's how we're dealing with housing. Next. A dynamic land use structure. So key land design, agroforestry, and regenerative practice. Uh, so we use key line, um, which is another way of talking about kind of on contour design for basic infrastructure on any piece of land. Um, basic infrastructure, so tracks and water and agroforestry corridors. So this little drawing that you can see here is a sketch that Graham did a little while back, um, just to give a kind of a bit of an idea of what it might look like. So you've got these agroforestry corridors which are laid either on contour, or actually just off contour uh, to allow for water distribution. Um, you've got your little land workers 
house at the end of each other one. Um, and you've got these corridors. So basically by using, uh, oh yeah, producers have access to as much land as they can work with their own hand or hand tools. Um, and by using a movable fence, producers may expand their land use along a corridor as their experience and capabilities grow and shrink it as their life situation changes. So you have this very fluid uh, land usage capacity um, within this system. Uh, all machine work and animal grazing systems are managed cooperatively by the Land Trust's Regenerative Agriculture, uh, sorry, Regenerative Agriculture Council, which anyone can join by offering a successful land usage proposal. And that's basically what happens on the other side of the fence. So you've got your, your spot, um, and then on the other side of the fence, you've got the kind of communally managed stuff uh, and all the grazing systems. Um, and this can all just kind of flow in and out of each other as different people's needs change. Um, our decision-making matrix drives land use towards production for common good and regenerative practice. Um, although actually the vast majority of people, social people have projects which naturally aim towards common good and regenerative practice. Um, and the antisocial people don't like our system. <laughs> so there's not much in the way of decision-making actually. But anyway. Um, so to compensate for such low footprint housing, so housing is quite small. Um, so to compensate for that, we do need well-furnished and fully accessible community spaces, cooperative workspaces and production and sales spaces as a necessary built part of the system. Um, so this is built on the ground. Tiny houses, mobile, fluid, moving in and out, cooperative workspaces, sales spaces on the ground, communally used. Um, so yes, this is while individuals in their small movable houses can flow through the system with their stages of life. Um, how are we doing? The time? I don't know. Yeah, great. So regenerative settlement. Um, kith and kin, land and other. If we're going to thrive, we need connection to each other and to the land that supports us. Um, just so you know, this is a picture of, uh, this is, a picture of Stanford Hall, part of the Stanford Hall CSA project, which is where me and Graham met and what Graham set up. You're looking at uh, what was sheep pasture for about 400 years uh, until Graham arrived. And that's uh, five years into the project. That little hut is uh, our friend Jack who designed, um, co-designed and built the farm ark. That's his little tiny house. He's a woodsman and a builder. So his accommodation needs are very small. So he's just got this tiny little very beautiful hut, which he built for 1,800 pounds. And he just takes that with him wherever he goes. Uh, and you can see a little uh, adobe roundhouse in the distance, which he built. Um, and just a mind blowing diversity of plants. And just in this picture, you can see biomass willow, uh, you've got wildflowers, um, some vegetables in there growing ducks, coming in and out. Um, yeah. This is what regenerative settlement could look like. When we asked regenerative land workers what stood in the way of them doing the regenerative land work that they wished to do, the main concern was security on the land. The main concern was security on the land. That is to say, am I going to be able to stay here if I get sick? If for whatever reason my business isn't successful, if I want to retire, really big one, if I want to retire, what's going to happen? <clears throat> So planning authorities seek to prevent human settlement on agricultural land in order to save agricultural land from being taken out of production and to protect these ecosystems, both very laudable objectives, um, which we support. Uh, however, the rural ecology that we have was created through centuries of small scale diverse farming practices. So if we're gonna maintain or restore these ecosystems, we need to be on the land to continue that work. And we are losing those systems on the land that we have in Lyme Regis. We are losing the coppicing. We are losing the meadows. We are losing, um, not the woodland, the woodland's doing all right. Um, but these were created through diverse farming practices and they're all, they're all basically being rewilded now because we can't get on there and do grazing and do coppicing and do veg growing and tree planting and whatnot. Um, contrary to popular belief, Diverse farming offers a more diverse ecosystem than rewilding and far outstrips that of industrial agriculture. 
and this is not a particularly in the you won't necessarily hear about this in the kind of mainstream media because it's the narrative is much more aimed at rewilding you know humans are bad and we really need to just take a step back and it's just not true the diversity of a regenerative farming system is is through the roof as soon as you have a human enter the scene the diversity just goes through the roof um yes so concerns from both perspectives as in from keeping agricultural land in production and protecting the ecosystems. Um, yeah, we want to solve this through regenerative settlement and neighborhooding, what we call neighborhooding. Um, so this is to do with the kind of demographic, if you will, on the land. Um, and this also uh, deals with order of settlement on a particular land trust. Uh, so we occupy land at a net density of one family unit per acre. Uh, land trust acreage is divided into four categories and settled in the following order. So first off, we have regenerative land workers, 25%. Um, and these are the guys or girls, anyone who can get on the land and start producing um, and uh, who can then uh, start producing a surplus so that the wider community can actually come in and be supported. So eligibility for that plot for regenerative land worker comes from a land usage proposal checked against regenerative practice and common good decision-making matrix. Um, active elders, 25%. So this is for uh, retiring land workers and elders who are willing and able to create regenerative settlement on behalf of self and next generation. And this is so important. We, we need elders and we need elders to help us. <laughs> we, need, we need help. Um, and eligibility for this is um, per, as per a monthly deliverables process, uh, three years total living on or off site. Um, and we're going to talk about that a lot more next week. Uh, families with young children, 25%. So these are the plots for people who are primarily producing children uh, and can allow relief from high production land work, although still have space for people who still want to work on the land, but it means that they don't have to try and juggle a family and uh, a full time agricultural enterprise at the same time. Um, priority for this uh, section is uh, given to those looking for rural livelihoods in the local area. And then we've got transitional, and this doesn't actually come last because each, um, each regenerative land worker basically can hold one transitional spot. Um, and this is great, the transitional spots are great for seasonal land workers, interns, um, or short leisure stays. So we have uh, internships are capped at one year before a pathway for permanent settlement is offered. So a regenerative land worker can bring in an intern, um, teach them, train them up. And at the end of that year, if the intern wants, uh, they could move on to their own plot. Uh, and if in that time they've got going on their tiny house, for example, um, yeah, the, path, the, uh, the pathway is offered if they, if they so choose. Okay, just gonna take a drink of water. For this one. I just want to say while well, you're having your drink of water that this is amazing. This is really exciting. I'm really enjoying it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. That's really kind. Wow. Yes. Okay. Tripartite altruistic economics. Let's do it. So, tripartite altruistic economics is a model which is taken from the natural distribution of energy within nature and can be seen in anything which endures, be that an organism, a species, a business, a mushroom, a galaxy, and so on. Energy taken in is split three ways between, firstly, the environment which supports that entity, second, the maintenance of that entity, and third, the evolution of that entity. So for example, in this, uh, cheeky little graphic that we put together. So you've got the energy of the sun going down into the plants. Um, you've got the bunny rabbit eating the grass. Now a third of the energy that the bunny rabbit takes in, it will actually poo out. And that goes back into the soil that feeds the microbes, feeds the soil food web, which feeds, uh, which feeds the grass and actually creates an environment which is conducive to the bunny rabbit. Um, a third of its energy will go into its own bodily maintenance. And then a third of its energy will go into its, uh, its evolution. 
So either into the creation of progeny um, or indeed the energy then going to the fox. Um, and this operates as a complex and interwoven fractal throughout creation. And it's intense. And once you know about it, you start seeing it everywhere and it's very beautiful. So in human terms, uh, your energy should ideally be split three ways between your environment, yourself, and your growth in, and your growth and evolution, either through children or th your spiritual evolution and innovation. Uh, however, in the current system, our current economic system, we have a fourth vampiristic element. And this is what tripartite altruistic economics removes. So firstly, a human gets to live on the land and meet their needs rent free as nature intended. That is our bottom line. That's where we start. You get to live on the land and meet your needs and not pay rent to exist. It's not who, it's when and how. It's not who, it's when and how. Exactly. Exactly. It's not who, it's when and how. People get to live on the land and meet their needs rent free as nature intended. So once the human has met their needs, and this is kind of what Carl was talking about, once the human has met their needs and wants to market their surplus, they're going to need cooperatives to process, trade, and or sell. Uh, and all income from this surplus is split in the same three ways as per the energy of the bunny. So in this little infographic, we've got, um, yeah, money, so money produced from the surplus. So a third will go to the land trust fund. That's the kind of bottom level um that's the environment which supports that and the land itself uh, a third goes direct to the producer uh, and a third goes up into the sales development and land acquisition fund and that's the kind of evolutionary fund that's what's um allowing this to expand and grow and in include more people as time goes on um so to go into a little bit more detail um so let's say I'm a producer, or well, who was it? Was it Catherine, who wanted to, who had a wanted to have it was sheep and, and a and a no dig garden. So let's say you're producing uh, cheese. I've got a courgette here. Um, no, actually, let's say goat's milk. Goat's milk will be easy. So let's say you're selling goat's milk and you're selling it at uh, a pound a liter. So of that pound, thirty three point three pence, one third goes to the land trust fund. And this might go directly to the land trust for an individual producer or via one of the farm based cooperatives. So via the uh, the, the dairy cooperative. Um, and you'll see here that the this gets split again within that fund. It gets split uh, in the same way. So basically one third, 11 P will go to the basic communally used infrastructure and tools. So, for example, uh, if you're milking, if you're using machinery to milk your herd or to process your milk, uh, that would come out of this pot. Uh, 11p would go to personnel costs, so to self, um, to carry out the necessary work that's not directly productive. So this would be, you know, putting in tracks, uh, fixing fences, um, fixing machinery that you need for your uh, dairy production, for example. Um, and then the top third, the evolutionary third, would go to infrastructure for specific new or expanding enterprises. So let's say at the end of the season, you had absolutely nailed it and you were like, actually, we need two machines because we're just, yeah, we can double our production. Um, and, we want yogurt now. And, but, and we want yogurt now. Oh, oh halloumi. Oh. <laughs> um, so that would come out of this part. That's the kind of evolutionary part of the land trust fund. That's the land trust fund. Your middle third goes to self. That goes directly to the producer uh, who pays no rent, lives in a house with minimal bills or footprint and gets their needs met from the land. And they set the price. And they set the price, by the way. The price that you see here is, is set by the producer who's, who's doing the production. Um, and we won't tell you how to live your life or spend your money. That's up to you, but we're sure you'll figure it out, how to look after your ground, yourself and your next generation your evolution uh, and then that top third uh, goes so that 33.3 pence goes to the sales development and land acquisition fund so this is for facilitating sales to the customer 
uh, developing existing enterprises and buying more land to put into trust. So we've got one third going to development on behalf of the land worker. So I have, uh, I've got my yogurt, I've got my halloumi, uh, and I'm doing all right selling it at a little stand on the road, but actually uh, a bunch of us have got together and decided we want a farm shop. That would come out of this, that would come out of this pot. Um, or for example, a food truck, which we actually already have, which is really exciting. Um, middle third, personnel costs. So this includes development of legal policy, protection of land trust uh, and stakeholders. This might be if you're involved in uh, developing, you know, marketing materials or, 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 you know, the accounting system. There's a pot for that, um, for personnel costs. And then the top third, 11 pence, goes directly into the land acquisition fund. And that's to buy more land to put into trust to allow more people to get back on the land. So this may all seem very simple and straightforward uh, until you attempt to calculate the creation of a cheese sandwich, a bowl of strawberry ice cream and a latte from the Land Trust's cafe. While maintaining full provenance of uh, over up to seven stages of production and an unlimited number of producers. Uh, it's, it's complicated. So this is where the Common Ground project and its software development are absolutely crucial if we are to develop in-house and share fairly, if this is going to work. Yeah, we need it to work and we need it to be watertight. Um, so that's where, our, that's where we come in and, and uh, our software development team. Uh, just a little more about the land acquisition fund. So that's the 11% uh, of proceeds from the surplus of any land trust. Uh, which is offered to the land acquisition fund and it may be used in the following ways. So firstly, uh, incubator groups may form regional common grounds um, with the group most ready to leap being given use of this fund, especially where availability meets shortfall. So that is to say, if you've got a group of people in Sheffield who are ready to go, uh, they found a piece of land and actually between, you know, the land is 250,000 and they've got 175 between them. Um, th that's the ideal situation where they're like, look, we are here, we're ready to go, we've got the land, and that land acquisition fund is then, a, it's like, yeah, great, go for it, get on the ground. Um, and then the second one uh, is for existing landowners um, who may create a common ground land trust from their land and use this 11% to buy themselves out of land ownership while providing a pension and the ability to retire on the land that they have cared for. They don't need to leave. Uh, they can just sit back and, and watch their land being put to beautiful communal productive use. Um, and these options can be combined with the gifting of land, uh, the gifting of money, gifting of resources into the project to ensure a return to common good. Um, and only that which is given as true gift can be accepted by, by the common ground project um, because no one, a gift given under duress is not a gift uh, and, and you can't truly give away anything until you're really ready to give it away. Yeah. Lime Regis Common Ground! Whoop, whoop, whoop. So that's our, that's our first land trust, uh, which is just outside Lime Regis off the A35. Um, and yeah, so uh, yeah, the land workers, the regenerative land workers are now weaving their proposals uh, with the help of the Active Elders team. And this is including a regenerative heritage grain grower, miller and baker, all in one, triple threat. Uh, two agroforestry and permaculture practitioners, a dairy herdsman, a goat herdsman, three organic market gardeners, a mushroom specialist, a market gardener specialising in building community farms, a herbalist and multiple small scale poultry operations. So, our job now, as the Common Ground Project, is to support these people through the planning process, uh, including research and really importantly, increasingly we're realising how important the campaigning for policy change uh, to ease the road for other regenerative land workers. That, that really does seem to be the path that we're on. Um, we're building a software system to hold together the economics of all of these operations. Uh, we're developing the food truck enterprise that will be the beginning of the sales arm of the organization, the food of the people of Lyme Regis. We've got a little food truck that's got like a hot and cold section and it's even it's got a horn that makes like a little uh, yeah, 
I'm really excited about it. So this, uh, yeah, this will enable us to sell hot and cold food within the four local towns, uh, Lyme, Axminster, Bridport and Seaton. Um, and we're gathering support for the physical work on the ground. Uh, we've started weekly sessions every Wednesday to lay the groundwork for the community farm, uh, which has been fenced out. It's on the land, but it's, it's for anyone in the local community. It's not like the land trust community farm. It's um, a space for anyone in the local community to come and grow or just help out. Um, and it's separate, independent of the uh, specific enterprises being run by individual producers. Next steps. So if this sounds wicked and you really want to find out how you can get involved, um, please, please, please come to our deliverables meeting, which is going to be next week on the 4th of April, a week today, um, to find out more about our workflows, the councils that we have and the teams that you can be a part of. Um, if you're ready to use the land in Lyme Regis, uh, please join our Facebook group, the Common Ground Project Lyme Regis, and send us a land usage proposal to commongroundprojectuk at gmail.com. Uh, to support the national movement, or if you want to set up a regional group, uh, join the Facebook group, the Common Ground Project Regenerative Rural Planning Network. So this one is, that's the one that's really, because the, yeah, Common Ground Project Lyme Regis is for the land trust, Regenerative Rural Planning Network is now where we're building support for uh, expansion and policy change. Uh, for Tiny House Resources and Connections, join Tiny House Collaboration UK, which was set up by our very own um, Rachel Trafford, which is, yeah, whether you're looking to build or dwell, uh, that's just a place to gather, exchange ideas, talk about what's available. Um, or you can ask questions now. Thank you. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, let me stop sharing. Are you going to, I guess people can, um, are you uh, going to share that information, Sammy, so that people know, you know, for the email, if they want to submit land usage proposals and whatnot? Yeah, absolutely. What what I'll do is um, I'll do a summary post and I can send it out to all of those um, of you who registered because I've got your email addresses and I'll put it on social media as well. And this recording will be saved on Rumble. So if you wanted to go back and look at any of it again, you could do. It was so informative, the so incredibly well researched. I have to say, I was really impressed with your knowledge around policies and the farming industry and taking into consideration all the issues with housing and obviously environmental impact. So um, I have to admit, some of it went over my head. <laughs> <laughs> sure. So. Um, but, but in summary, you know, what I think is amazing is that you're looking at creating community, you've looked at all elements of community, and you're doing it with in a way that's going to um, have, give people security within a land trust, working in a regenerative practice that's going to be excellent for the environment, but that is sustainable for future generations, you know, and, and that's what I love so much. I love the community aspect, the communal spaces. Uh, that support network that you're creating within communities, but across communities within the land trust too. So I imagine those who are setting up, like Lyme Regis, are going to be pioneers leading the way and then guiding others to come along and take that format and create yeah. their own. Um, I, 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 I could go on for ages, and I'm not going to, because I'm sure lots of people have got many questions. Um, if you've got a question, please raise your hand. If you'd rather pop it in the chat because you'd rather not ask in front of other people, please do. If you want to digest this and go away and take it with you, there'll be more opportunity next week for a fuller discussion. Um, today was really about sharing the detail with you so that you could get a feel for where it was going. But um, Keen and Graham, I thank you so much. Um, every time I hear it, I understand it a bit better <laughs> and it impresses me more each time. Um, so I'm going to stop oh, yeah. talking. And the form, sorry, we are going to, we've also got a, um, a Google form for people, okay. which we can, we'll share with you, Sammy, uh, but basically just a data capture form to say, if you're interested, it's like name, email, um, what kind of, what category you might fit into on the land, whether you're interested in like supporting, investing, what you might be interested in contributing and we can talk we're going to talk more about that next week as well but we do have that form and it is actually on our facebook page it's on the regenerative rural planning facebook page and it's pinned uh, to the top if you do want to go on there and submit that um so i just wanted to say that and the second thing i wanted to say was 
in relation to Sammy saying some of it went over your head. Yes, absolutely. These are this is like seriously complex stuff, and I really would encourage people to just, you know, there's no stupid questions. Please do just ask, um, because this is how we got to here and with these systems was was through conversation. Um, so please, yeah, if there's something you don't understand or you want a bit more clarification on, please do ask. Um, yeah, I'll put links. I'll put links on our social media to your Facebook group. I'll send any information out to people here tonight, and we'll have links on our website, um, which obviously links back to the Common Ground Project because they are one of our partners. Um, so yeah, we'll look for for hands up, and I'll look for messages in the chat. Yeah, cool. Um, So yes, right, we've got questions. Uh, I'm just gonna go top of my screen. So Fokba, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Yeah, uh, you're pronouncing that correctly, but it is Frisian, you know, and that is uh, a very small amount of land also in Netherlands, wow. the Northern part. Mm. So um, first of all, compliment for your passion. Really, I love it. Two, um, the way you are working it out based upon research is really good. I love it. And um, the question I have, question one, is what kind of trust do you use? What kind of uh, legal framework is that? And how do you get your trustees? And those points are regular points in the forming of trusts, as you know. Mm -hmm. And question two is, are you flexible in your approach? Of course, there's a basic thing, and I love that. But is it possible, for instance, to cooperate when you set up a um, com combination with another strategy like an eco village? Then another question, um, how do you go around with the planning situation in the third dimension? And how do you go around in the planning situation in the fifth dimension? Because at the moment we are in a transition process. And actually, uh, I'm working already 20 years on the research, what you're doing, uh, but very widely, very broad. And that taught us a lot. And I support completely your ideas, but I look especially to how can you combine forces? Because we're in a situation where unity and cooperation is the key for future generations. Those are the points. Absolutely. Yeah, um, yeah go for it. So Graham's, Graham is <laughs> that, here. Yeah, Graham is listening in and yeah. Uh, I, I hide in the background when Kean's presenting because he's better without me over his shoulder. Um, so your the middle part of your question, your middle question there basically answers it as in, so, what kind of legal structures, what kind of formations do we use? It's very important that everybody uses their own. So we're not here to tell anyone what legal structures to use, what kind of, you know, like, do, you, do I want to be a CIO, a charity, you know, a CIC? Like, we don't care. And actually, the non-centralization of this is the power of the thing. So we're here to support independently. And actually, um that's why we come up with the common ground project so we could step back and own no land you know like have no employees have nothing you know so there's nothing that can be grabbed hold of here apart from the odd thread here or there and this is the same to the planning policy as well now the people of lime regis common ground have been incredibly brave because we said to them you must stick to the absolute letter of the law and the guidance of the local planning authority so that we can record the story, we can show the situation we're in, while the rest of the people in the UK are doing it in whatever way they like, you know, we'll still support you mm. however you want to do it, but we'll tell the story of how it's going at Lyme. And we started, it's not pretty, but the people on the team are incredible and the proposal they put across and, you know, public support behind it, I'm sure they'll get there, but it's going to be tough. Yeah. A big mountain and I hope you guys keep watching and I hope that you go forward, build your tiny houses, make your communities, do what you're doing. And so long as it can be linked together by this economic system, we can all work together because we know it's going to common good. And it can replicate. It can just self-replicate. Yeah. Yeah. And balance and share resources. 
like a mycelial network. <laughs> I have to unmute there and just shout, yeah, nice to meet them. I always feel about it. Sorry, I really had to shout that out. I'm going back now. <laughs> um, yes. Did, Did that, that answer all of your questions? The first question, where are we at? What's the structure that we're using? So, yeah, in answer to that question, uh, the head of our legal team has gone to India for like a month. <laughs> <laughs> he's just gone to India and he's like, oh, sorry, guys, I'll be back when I'm back. No, but actually, <laughs> but, but we don't really we don't really need to do the structure thing. We offer the specialists for each land trust. So when they're That's ready, so when the team's ready down in line, we go, OK, well, these are the your various options and professionals, you know, there's no this kind of law. They know that bit. Yeah, and they come in and they advise, but you know, you guys will all uh, go through that process depending on your situation. You know who you are, like, and and yeah, and you want to work in. your level of expertise. Because yeah, if you've done this kind of work before, then it's going to be way easier to come in and say like, oh, actually, we've used this structure previously and it worked pretty well. Um, and and our, and our capture form also gathers the legal professionals in the various fields, so that yeah. means that we just push that team around to each land trust effectively exactly. so anybody who you know knows about this stuff and wants to get, get involved so far you know we've got i don't know like five or six on the team who are pretty knowledgeable yeah um yeah and we yeah we just kind of push that around to whoever's uh you know doing the work i think rebecca roberts has a question uh-huh Hello, oh, thank you so much. This has been really inspiring. I am working to um, be part of a, of a community and I'm looking into all of these different um, wonderful initiatives. One of the things that I've seen works really well in the communities and I would love you to weigh in on this and that is um, in this um, climate of the people governing themselves, um, how do we make decisions that everyone is represented and um, and everyone has a say and it's not majority rule? Do you have models that you work with? I mean, obviously, consensus works in most communities well, but do you have a model that you work with for decision making? Just say someone wanted to uh, you know, have a cricket farm and <laughs> need all of the trees leaves and that was their thing, um, it would obviously have a negative effect on everybody else. Obviously nobody's gonna do the cricket thing, but you get what I'm saying. Um, yeah. There's gonna be someone who wants to do something that isn't going to necessarily be for the good of the whole and how do decisions get make it, made during in those situations? Yeah. yeah, great question. Yeah, so there's masses in that as well. Um, originally, uh, as we were forming the project, we went out and basically asked, asked everybody how they wanted to do it. And uh, so sociocracy was the kind of feeding um, uh, culture of, of how this can be done. And there's courses on this online as well, so you can see how all of that works. And that also allows for the confederacy as well as in, you know, it's a very nicely structured bottom down uh, system. We have added a few little tweaks into it based on the fact that 20% of the population are suppressive of human betterment, you know, so we decided that actually on a council, um, an 80% majority would be fine. And we decided to make sure that one person was against. So at least if uh, you um, all agree you want to do something and it's all fine. There's one person who's weighing up the quantity surveying. Well, actually, it's going to cost us this much money. You know what I mean? It might take this much time. There are reasons not to, you know. Um, and, and all of that is like covered in our structures and videos and that kind of mm -hmm. thing. Yeah. And they're there to support you. But actually, we don't care how you manage yourselves. It's nothing to do with us. You know, we're just there really to offer a model that we can link together. Um, and these things come up in Confederacy as in, you know, so we have our monthly councils. One thing really that is really important is that farmers are left to do their job. So the Regenerative Agriculture Council, you can only enter it if you've put in an accepted regenerative land use proposal, because yeah. to do that, 
even to get one through a matrix, you actually need to know a bit about what you're doing. Um, <laughs> and once you're in that council, you know, then you have a say uh, within the same voting system that everybody else does. But that's then defended. So then all your other councils, like your active elders councils, for example, or your young families councils, they can come and 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 they can be by, uh, you know, active elders can be by interest alone. You know, I'm interested in creating regenerative settlement. Age doesn't really matter. Families with young children, obviously, there's an obvious, uh, <laughs> you know, I'm entry serious. point, you know, <laughs> like, yeah. Um, and then it, the confederacy allows those to come together so that everybody's different ways of working in community actually filter up and, you know, and that just develops and flows. But there is a lot of work out there on, you know, like problem uh, resolution, conflict resolution. These yeah, kind of things. And organization, yeah. Um, yeah, so yeah. there's resources we can support you with on it, but obviously, yeah, we're not um, we're not selling we're not telling someone if we're going to support a land trust. You know, you've got to use anything exactly, like that. Exactly. Yeah. <clears throat> but the advantage of the system that we're currently using is in in terms of like councils by interest, is it means that you can have rather than like an entire community having to be involved in every single decision, you can actually get you know decisions can be made by the people to whom it is actually relevant in service of the wider community, so that. You know the region ag council is a great example of that um but it just means it can be really dynamic and fluid without it you know because it can get quite clunky quite quickly um in these things uh does that answer your question yeah Brilliant. thank you can i can i add to that sure please um you use the word trust yeah that's crucial for all of us especially in this time that young people who see their future evaporate because of the lockdowns <laughs> need trust in themselves and not fear where yeah. there is fear in the people there's no trust because they cannot be love love and fear are two opponents use trust when you talk with politicians if you trust them but that's a crucial point <laughs> um but the trust in yourself, the passion that, what's your name, Chan? Yeah, yeah. Shows during his presentation is the passion we all need to have to survive and to have our future generations survive and flourish. That is what we have to keep in mind. That's it. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Papa. Thank you. Is it okay if we go on to Joanna? I'm conscious of time and there's a few questions in the chat. Is that okay? okay. Thank you, Papa. Thank you. Um, yeah. Um, again, thanks. Really uh, coherent proposal. Um, so, and I apology if I've missed something and I was a bit late, actually. I, well, I was trying to get in and I wasn't letting, but um, so I just wanted to clarify it. Um, and maybe it would help for other people as well. But like, so I'm still a little unclear about what your offer or offers are. So obviously you've got a site in Lyme Regis, which is purchased and you're asking for, you're, you're open for proposals, but then for everywhere else, anywhere else, um, you know, so if there's a local group and there's some people, a local freedom group, um and there's people recognizing the need for sovereignty and saying oh, i want to buy some land or you know and perhaps for sharing it or whatever so is it that the common ground project can sort of support that group or anyway what can you clarify for me what your actual offer at the moment is and i expect it might grow as well but where, <laughs> what are you ready to kind of offer yeah that makes sense yeah yeah yeah, that, yeah, thank you. yeah great question so we've got a little cgp stamp you know and it's just a little cgp if you will use the economic model um for your land trust if our wonderful producers ever actually manage to produce anything in the face of the tyrannical uh, government and councils <laughs> then <laughs> 11% of that money is going into a pot and it will go to the land trust that's first ready to leap. And 
that economic model does come with a few restraints. For example, money from that common ground fund cannot be used to fund any primary produce. So you can't go and buy grass with it because it would break the system, you know, and there's things within this model that you can look deeper into and you'll see why. You know, you also can't restrict the movement of animals, actually. Uh, you know, you can't actually use that system with slavery. So there are little bits within it um, that you need to stick to it. And, it. and it will assure that your organization is genuinely cooperative and genuinely has no slavery in it if you stick to it. And that means that people can get confidence in it. They know they can nourish it with their energy. And that means that we can say, OK, well, then we'll nourish it with the energy of this land trust here or this land trust that got mm -hmm. going here or that one. But what it also enables us to do is take that um, amazing capture form that Haley, our project manager, has created and to pull all of the supporting, because there's loads of people that want this who don't actually want to live in a tiny house on a patch of land growing carrots, you know, um, or that are ready to retire but need to see this happening before they can block off thinking they've done a good job. Um, and, you know, for, for those people, um, their efforts put into it can go towards, uh, so we said about the deliverables process. So the efforts that they're putting in can say, okay, three years we've worked on this. We have delivered, we've been willing and able to create regenerative settlement on behalf of the next generation. And now I get my retirement plot in it. Well, that regenerative farmer over there provides my food for me. I can, you know, help with the kids from the, uh, you know, the young families over there that are in that part of the neighborhood. And it gives us a way of just tracking and making sure that we are delivering on what we're saying we're doing. Because let's face it, um, there's a lot of people who might call themselves elders in the world when actually all we really want from them is to be able to use this earth and to you know, look after ourselves. Mm. So that's what we're calling an elder. <clears throat> Those plots, you know, are accounted for by the model that we're offering people as well. Yeah. So obviously we're not going to send you our legal team if you're not going to use this model that ensures the cooperative nature. But the rest of how you do it, you know, where we, like where you get your land, your money, the land usage pattern, whatever, you know, you can, yeah, you can do, do what you want to do. Or you could speak to us about it because with each new stage in the process, we're getting more and more kind of knowledge and understanding and people's inputs. Mm. So also at the far other end of the spectrum, it's like, yeah, we've got a legal team. We have a model. We have a land usage pattern. We have a drone. So we could literally go and like drone map your site, put a contour map together, talk to you about, about land usage. You know, that's especially Graham. That's absolutely his um, bread and butter uh, is how to like physically set up a regenerative uh, farm. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, we have the other end of the scale of what we're offering to do. So that little CGP stamp, you don't want to use no silly economic model. You know, you just want to get on with it. But you do need to see this happening. If it's net neutral to us, you know, it's not costing our team anything, it's not costing us anything. You, all the materials are open source, so you take those and you apply whichever bits of it you want. Yeah. But also joining the broader campaigns for, um, you know, obviously we're going to have to coordinate action here because I'm not expecting that the council is just going to go, oh, all right, then have the world back, you know? I like that's not what we think is going to happen at all. So we're going to need to coordinate actions such as big barn builds, you know, such as deployment, such as effects on the food supply chain that says, actually, this group of farmers isn't going to give the supermarkets their pork. They're going to give it directly to the public now because actually, you know, it's not viable doing it that way anymore. So it's pulling together those net neutral actions as well. So it's, it, it depends where you want to sit in it, basically. Yeah. But obviously, any, anybody who's looking to collaborate and set up a land trust, you know, we'd set up a separate work stream for it and we'd talk through it and we'd go over the finer details until everybody's happy. Can I interject here? Sorry. I'm really... Um, I, I, hopefully that's, that's answered your question, Joanna. What I'm thinking is we are having a part to next week where there will be a lot more discussion where you can go away digest the information perhaps watch this again think about your individual position where you're at what you're interested in and um anyone is free to email Graham and Keen in the meantime 
um, we've got an email address for them so that you can send us. Uh, that's OK, guys, isn't it? That's yeah. totally fine. Yeah. So I've just yeah. seen your message uh, as well. Simon. And, and also that. at the top of the Facebook groups in the featured sections, there's like land usage contracts, like summaries, updates, you know, all sorts of stuff that you can kind of wade through and, um, you know, like figure out stuff. So if I just mention, just to finish off, if that's okay, sorry to cut it oh, short. Okay. But... Yeah, it's all right, I suppose. But... <laughs> uh, sorry, yeah, someone's just come off mute. Yeah. Um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> it's all right, I suppose. <laughs> It'll do. <laughs> sorry. Uh, if I go through a few of the quick questions, maybe you could just yeah. sort of give a quite a short summary answer and then maybe we can come back next week or email you. Mm -hmm. um, there's lots of thanks in the chat, by the way. Lots of people saying how interesting and amazing yeah, it's yeah. been. Anything happening in Hearn Bay? I'm thinking that's a not yet. Not yet. I don't. I don't okay. Know. Yeah. Um, uh, how did Lime Regis Lime Regis Group acquire the land? Yeah. That that was this guy decided to do it out of inheritance yeah. as a trigger for gifted economy. Yeah. Okay. Did I miss something or do you still have to have money to take part? No, you don't have to have anything. No, actually. Um, um, I'm assuming what you would do is you would offer your skill set and then share, uh, you know, you'd make a proposal on how you would contribute through yeah. possibly your regenerative um, agriculture experience. Yeah, so people who are ready to get on the ground, get on the ground, you put in your land usage proposal and you get on the ground. Obviously, if there's accommodation, things to look after, you know, there needs to be support on that. And we've got the tiny house uh, collaborative group that basically helps and guides through that. Uh, obviously, if you're going to build your own tiny house, it's still going to take a bit of money. Uh, but mm. to get involved, you know, it's like, um, yeah, yeah. You start, it's a path you get on. Exactly. <clears throat> that fits well so he said I'm a natural builder I can offer skills more than money and I think that's what this model does it brings all of these elements in people who've got the skills people who've got the knowledge people who've got the money and I think that's why it works so well are there scenarios where people would lose the right to live on the land great question Hannah thank you oh, yeah uh, yeah, so, 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 uh, yeah so our thing is if you're born on earth uh, then you have the right to be and remain on land but we do have the like four sections so basically if you have um you know if you're working the land if you have a family with young children if you are retired and then there's the transitional and those get reviewed you know so for example each year it's like how much land do you want to use if you said none it's like well okay do you need to be uh, do you want an active elders plot are you having a kid or is it transitional? And a transitional is only available for a year. So you'd have to fit into one of the other slots. But that's only one land trust, because if you divorce Nobed next door, you want to be able to, <laughs> you know, carry on doing what you want to do. So you're going to go to another land trust, maybe, or, mm. you know, yeah. So you move around. That's great. Live your life. Um, OK. Obviously, so there's, there is a clincher to that, though, in terms of law. You know, if somebody's there breaking the law, we're not above the law here. We're giving land trust. So, right. you know, we... <laughs> glyphosating, yeah. glyphosating the whole patch. You know, other people well, on the land trust might have something to say. Well, about. that would be a breach of your land usage contract. That would actually, because, yeah, that would, that would be know, a breach of contract. Yeah, because the Regen Ag Council aren't going to accept it. Exactly. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> I've got one last question here and then I'm going to kind of wrap things up if that's all right with you. Um, although I'm sure we could talk for hours more. Um, so final question is from Sarah. If there are some people who just want to grow for their own family, how will they feed money into the common needs of the community since they'll not be selling? Or is that situation not possible? Um, so we would uh, direct them to the community farm. So if uh, every land trust, our land trust that we're uh, setting up ourselves, you know, we, we've got, we always have a community farm element in them. Uh, I would suggest others do that as well, because that's where those people can go to. Um, and, and of course, they're producing something, you know, the majority of people in the world are producing nothing. So if you came along and produced a lettuce, you would be doing way better than the majority of people on the planet. So actually it's helping, even if you're just producing a bit for yourself. And because of the 
because you're not um, paying any rent, basically because you're kind of allowed, you, you can produce what you produce. And if, if you were to produce a surplus, you could sell that through the cooperative. You know, let's say that you just had loads of chard one year and actually you, you had way more than you could use and you'd made a load of kimchi. Uh, you could put that through a cooperative and put it in the farm shop. And actually for that year, you could get, you could get your third out of that surplus. Um, you know, so that the kind of the, the cooperative structure means that actually people individuals can kind of dip in and out of that as they wish um but if they don't want to that's also totally fine that's what the young families with children especially um yeah. is, is about yeah but there is there is a, man, a minimum land usage for regen ag plot so it's like if you weren't producing anymore you'd be directed to the community farm at yeah. that point yeah i would like to add uh, please um, it is very good to see what the combinations are in the area. There are quite some uh, some farmer shops already. Look what what how you can combine forces, because mm. what I said, cooperation is the force for, of the future. Mm. Not international level, not national level. It is regional and local level that's crucial. If you look at uh, the, the uh, predominant uh, economic strategy by the Mises Institute, which is based upon cooperation, you see all the elements that you are using in there. Hmm. So that you can use the Mises, M-I-S-E-S -S, Institute as a background to support your research. It is an international institute, which is very, very, very much acknowledged. Cool, thank you. Great. Okay, right, amazing. I think uh, we're gonna have to wrap up there. Um, I can't thank you enough, Graham and Kim. That's amazing. Um, great feedback in the chat. Um, I've just put in there that I'll send all information and links out to you. Um, we've got your emails request. for that very reason. I and have I think... a request. Oh yes, please do, go on. It's a really important one to me. So I always feel these meetings, rather than rushing at the end, yeah. I really like to do a minute silence. So anybody who wishes to stay, to be with what we've spoken about and to ground the energy of what we're doing, can do that. So I was wondering if you could do your wrap up and then leave us for a minute to do that. Brilliant. Love, 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 love that. Che from Crops Not Shops uh, ended with a, a prayer last week and it was such a way to end it. So I welcome that so much. Thank you so much. Um, um, just to say, Cara R, I'm not on Facebook. Any other way to keep informed? So that, that'll be the, the email link that you'll be sending out, right, Sammy? Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll email you all with the information so that you can know all ways of accessing. And I think Ken is hoping to talk to you about a dairy herd as well. So it's all very exciting. <laughs> Thank you all so much for your time and energy and positivity. Um, these evenings are growing and growing and it's great to have some regular faces. So thank you so much. Um, hopefully we'll see you again next week. If you'd like to join us, please email in and then we'll send you the link again. It helps us just kind of um, ensure that not too many people turn up if they're not genuinely interested. Um, so I'm going to sign off and um, I'll probably stop recording or Mags hopefully can stop recording for us.